we have another double parsha. Uh, we are going through Leviticus at a much faster pace than uh, normal. Uh, last week we had two parshas, Tazriya Mitzorah. This week, again, we have two parshas, Achare and Kedoshim. Achare, or sometimes called Achare Mos, which means after the death, after the death of the two sons of Aaron. And Kedoshim means holy ones. And again, there is an internal connection between these two parshios, and that's why if you're going to have to marry two parshas together, it made sense to put these two together. And we'll see that there's a lot of uh, overlapping themes between these two parshas. It begins, Achre begins with a detailed laws of Yom Kippur. What happens, what does Aaron do on Yom Kippur? Uh, what are the various sacrifices and the processes? Everything that you need to know about Yom Kippur, well, almost everything you need to know, is found in the very first section, chapter 16 of the book of Leviticus. But it begins with a very interesting preamble. And Hashem spoke to Moshe after the death of Aaron's two sons. A couple of weeks ago, we read about that. When they approached before the Hashem and they died, and Hashem said to Moses, speak to Aaron, your brother, shouldn't come at all times into the Holy of Holies, only on Yom Kippur. That's the beginning of the Parsha. And the, the question everyone's trying to grapple with over here is when we're about to learn about the laws of Yom Kippur, and it happens to be, incidentally, when it hap- when it was told over to Moshe to tell Aaron, happened to have been after the death of the sons of Aaron. But why is it necessary to kind of expose the wound again, to say, after the death, why are we reinvoking the death of Aaron before we tell us, before we're told about uh, the process of Yom Kippur? So there's a few answers, I want to go through them here. Rashi tells us, first Rashi on the parsha. He says that this is sort of a warning. We know that the two sons of Aaron, they did an unauthorized sacrifice. They walked into the Holy of Holies. Now, Aaron is going to be warned not to go into the Holy of Holies at all times, only at special times. And therefore, in order to give some oomph to the warning, we say to him, we, we kind of we reinvoke what happened last time someone walked into the Holy of Holies without permission after the death of the two sons of Aaron. Don't make the same mistake. Says Rashi, he gives us an example. You have a, uh, a sick person goes to the doctor. And the doctor tells him, you have two doctors or two sick people, and, the, and they go to the two doctors, and one doctor says, well, let me give you a list of recommended Activities: Eat this, don't eat that, you know, take this medication, not that medication, and follow the doctor's orders. That's what the first one tells him. The second physician, he gives him the same exact diagnosis and roadmap, but he tells him, and by the way, last guy who came here who deviated is now dead. Which one of them has more impact on the patient? Obviously, the one who was told, if you deviate... This is how you will end up. Aaron is being told, do not go at all times into the Holy of Holies. You know who tried that? The death of your your sons. They went in. They hadn't brought an unauthorized sacrifices and they're dead. And by the way, you do the same thing and you too will die. I was thinking a good way to apply this to us, the study of history. Well, why why do we study history? Some people are not interested at all in the past. But one of the best reasons to study history is because you learn lessons. It's um, it's like the, the scientific method. People have hypotheses and they try them out and let's see how it works out and let's evaluate the results. And I think that this is really the lesson of, or well, this is one of the most powerful lessons of the study of history. We look at what happened in the past and we say, okay, some people already tried what maybe we are considering Let's look at their results. And if they die doing it, they maybe maybe it wasn't such a great idea. Maybe we shouldn't we should avoid that as well. Because as you study specifically Jewish history, you see there's a lot of patterns where people make the same mistake again and again. Now, how is it possible? How is it possible? If you just learn history, you see, don't do these things. And people do them again. And this is the lesson. After the death of the sons of Aaron, or after, just look at what happened last time something was tried. And maybe that would be more informative, would give you a more informative decision and not to make the same mistakes. That's, I think, a good lesson to draw out from this. I want to um, 
just take some other lessons maybe that we could have of the juxtaposition of the death of the sons of Aaron or the recounting of the death of the sons of Aaron before being told about the Yom Kippur service. Aaron, obviously, he had a, a tragedy that... Who knows what it's like, you know? It's, it's, you're having this huge national celebration and you finally have cleared away all the problems that golden calf and God's amongst you and then your sons die. And obviously there's terrible anguish and pain and despair. But here Moshe is telling him, we could take this and try to draw something positive. What can we learn from this experience? How, how can we improve? And Moshe is actually providing him a certain modicum of comfort and consolation by telling him, yes, your sons died. But you know what? Their death is not for nothing. They could help us in the future. We could use their suffering, so to speak, and your suffering as a way of really learning a powerful lesson. And the lesson is, of course, that be very careful about not going into the Holy of Holies. Then every Kohen Gadol of the next 1,500 years is going to say, there's a lesson here. Nadav and Avi are teaching us and continue to teach us uh, for eternity. Uh, I think, uh, you know, we have, we're celebrating now, or we're commemorating now the the Omer, uh, the bridge between uh, between Pesach and Shavuos. And one of the events that happened was the death of the 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva. He had a huge empire, 24,000 students, and Talmud tells us that <coughs> as a result of their um, non-respect of each other, they all died during this period. And that's why we have a national mourning uh, for this terrible tragedy. But what did Rabbi Tiva do? So uh, you think about it, your, your life's work was shattered before you. 24,000 students, what a legacy. And now that is totally vanquished. And you have two options. Are you going to take this lesson and start to implement it in your rebuild or you're just going to be sad and morose and and depressed and not do anything about it? Rabbi Tiva says, you know what the Talmud tells us is that he he traveled elsewhere. And he recruited new students. And those students are the ones, are the titans of Torah that continued on the tradition. And these are also students who learned the lesson of their peers and did not have the lack of respect for each other. And you know what? We exist as a nation thanks to that decision by Robert Heaven and his students to rebuild after the tragedy. And I think... You know, everyone in, in, in their lives has some degree of challenges and some degree of, of tragedy and some degree of suffering. And there's an opportunity. Well, or there's a question. The question is, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to just just be sad and, and, and go into this spiral of despair? Or are you going to say, what can I learn? How can I improve? How can I use this for some positive uh, outcome? Now, we actually read this snippet from the Book of Leviticus every Yom Kippur. And of course, that's the pattern with all holidays. We read on the holidays, not the Parsha, that we're up to chronologically, but the section of the Torah that relates or that talks about that particular holiday. So we read the same Kippur. And I think that it does have a very Yom Kippur-specific message as well. Yom Kippur is all about taking a catalog of where we are as a as individuals and what our goals are and kind of looking at the big picture and seeing how we can improve and trying to repent and redirect ourselves and really evaluate what's important and what's necessary and what are my goals and how do I get there. And throughout the course of the year, there's, you know, we, we get caught up into all, in all the other things and, and we get, we lose focus. And I think, is there a more powerful lesson in the Torah than the death of the sons of Aaron to bring us into the Yom Kippur mode. These were great people who made a mistake and they probably had some justification for their behavior. But regardless, even those people and even with a nation of, of holiness, 
still, like, the activities done against God, they exact a response. And for them, it was immediate. And for us, we don't know when it's going to be. But in Yom Kippur, it's a very powerful lesson to uh, to think about. Think about this lesson of what happened to the sons of Aaron, and that can help us get into Yom Kippur mode and hopefully ourselves also find a path towards repentance and self-examination. Now, the first 35 verses or so of the Parsha uh, talk about the details of the Yom Kippur service, what animals are sacrificed. So you look at verse 3, it tells us there's a young bull, which is a sin offering, a ram, which is an ola, an elevation offering. What clothing does the Kohen Gadol wear? Uh, the, the only time uh, throughout the year that someone walks into the Holy of Holies is the Kohen Gadol on Yom Kippur. And we're told specifically he has to wear his alternate garments, his white garments, not his gold garments. We read uh, in the book of Exodus about the very fascinating, beautiful gold clothing that the Kohen Gadol uh, had. So he had these special gold clothing, yet when he walked into the Holy of Holies, he wore only the white clothing. And the reason for that is that uh, we've had a checkered history, if you will, with gold specifically the golden calf. And therefore, at this most auspicious moment of the year, the coin god of the high priest walking into the Holy of Holies, the last thing we want, any remnant of any any indication of any sort, is anything gold. And therefore, he puts on the white clothing. And uh, we have also the two goats. They have to select two goats that are identical. And then they have to draw the lots. One of them is brought as a sacrifice. And one of them is chucked off the mountain as the scapegoat. Which is a way of saying we're asking God, even if we're not worthy of being uh, of being granted atonement, just just give it as a freebie. Uh, just as the scapegoat is not is not guilty necessarily, and it was arbitrary which one we chose to brought, be brought as a sacrifice in the temple, and which one to be chucked off a, a rocky mountain. Give us the same uh, treatment and just uh, grant us vindication for free. And one of them is selected for Hashem. One of them is thrown to Azazel. And there's the incense offering, which is, uh, which is brought into the Holy of Holies and the various procedures of what the coin god does, the high priest does. And of course, there's various stages of atonement. First, he finds atonement for him and his family, then for the entire Kohanic clan. And finally, for all of the people of Israel, and they take the goat and they have it uh, taken by a uh, designated walker to the wilderness, chucking it off the mountain. He has to go back into the uh, Holy of Holies and pull out the shovel and the ladle. And that is essentially the brief overview of the uh, of the commandment of Yom Kippur. If you want to know the details of the chucking of the animal, uh, I would tell you to go to the book of Yoma. Yoma means day. It's a, a one of the 63 books, 63 books of Mishnah, which deals with the day of Yom Kippur. Everything that happens, you can find a copy of it in English. It's very fascinating because it goes through in detail what happened. And uh, part of it, of course, is dedicated to uh, this process. You can find it in uh, uh, modern editions of the Machsar of Yom Kippur. People have a tradition to study the book of Yoma on the day of Yom Kippur because it talks about everything that happens in Yom Kippur. Actually, if you um, look at the afternoon service, the Musaf service of Yom Kippur in the unabridged edition, you'll see that part of the prayer does discuss the details of the Yom Kippur uh, procedures, including this process. Now, I just want to also take uh, a moment to just... the, The broad idea of not having a familiarity with the Holy of Holies. I think it's a, it's it's also another lesson that we could take for ourselves. The Talmud tells us that when people walked into the temple, there was two entrances. And you had to walk in from one and exit through the other. You couldn't walk in and exit in the same entrance. You know, you, you go to the museum and you can walk through the museum and go back to the same entrance or you go out through, through the entrance in the other direction. You have to always take the... So if you start from the north, you end in the south. You start from the south, you end in the north. And the reason why is for the same reason. We want people to be awed and wowed by spiritual experiences. 
However, that sensitivity gets dulled and calloused by exposure, by continued exposure. If someone's continued, continually exposed to anything, any phenomena, it's not exciting anymore. I would say, uh, dare I say, probably the physician who spent the first time seeing a cadaver and started to dissect it, it was a big deal day one. Uh, but on day 5,000, it's not such a big deal. It's become it, – it kind of loses its its pizzazz. And that's uh, that's that works in both directions. You know, I think that uh, we have its um, uh, exposure in our world to a lot of things that maybe were shocking the first time we had, had exposure to them. And then progressively it gets less and less uh, exciting or, or, or meaningful. Uh, and we put up with it and it becomes the new norm. Uh, if you remember back in uh, Exodus, we learned about the nation of Amalek. Jewish people were on top of the world when they left Egypt. Uh, no one touched them. Everyone was terrified of them, besides for one nation, the Amalek. And Amalek were basically a bunch of kamikaze artists. They came and they started, they picked the fight with the biggest bully, uh, and they lost, but they did it in spite, even though it meant their own demise. And the Talmud tells us that the Amalek, they were like someone who jumps in to the scolding bath. The Jewish people were at the peak of their powers right after the Exodus. And everyone was terrified of jumping in to battle. But Amalek says, we're jumping in, even though, even though we're going to die. And what they did is they cooled the bath. Once they did it, Everyone else gets desensitized to that, and future wars become possible. But this is a broad idea, widely applicable in both directions. Our spiritual experiences, we have to try to find a way to keep them fresh. You know, we have a Shabbos every week. And if you do it every week, maybe it's not so exciting. If you have a spouse, you see them every day. You get desensitized. And that, that's a problem. You have to find a way to keep things fresh on the positive side. And on the negative side, you want to make sure that you don't callous yourself and desensitize yourself to the things that are bad. Because once you do that, it doesn't have any – I think we talk about the Syrian civil war, for example. How many people died since 2011? It's, it's enormous. It's a staggering number. And we kind of talk about it like it's no big deal. I'm not trying to say we should become activists. Maybe we should. I don't know. But my point is, is that this is an example where it doesn't it doesn't mean anything anymore because we've exposed ourselves to it. The fact that there's hundreds of thousands of people that are dead and displaced. I'm not trying to get evoke political feelings. I'm just saying, just the idea of thousands of civilians dying or hundreds of thousands of civilians dying. If we if we were never exposed to such carnage. It would mean something. Now we kind of we lost it, and and I, I think if we took our great 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 grandparents and we told them that there's people being shot in the streets of Chicago or people dying by the thousands uh, in they'd Syria, be they'd be horrified. Yeah. And you know what? But if we told them that every day, they probably wouldn't be horrified anymore. Uh, in, in, there's a, a fascinating, well, if it could be fascinating, just analysis of what was happening outside of Europe during the Holocaust. Because uh, there are stories of people that made it their life's business to try to help and save as many Jews as possible. And then there are those who just live their life. And I, I think the difference is, is that both of them were horrified initially, but one of them did not allow themselves to become calloused. And therefore, they were so motivated, like who wouldn't be motivated? Now, uh, back to Yom Kippur here, we see, so there's, uh, uh, we're told in verse uh, 29 that on the 10th day of the 7th month, which is the month of Tishrei, the 10th day is Yom Kippur, you shall afflict yourself, so the five afflictions, don't do any work. And on this day, so verse 30 is, is the critical verse of describing what Yom Kippur is, on this day... He shall provide atonement for you to purify you from all your sins before Hashem you shall become purified. Uh, this verse really captures what Yom Kippur is. We're before Hashem. We're close to Hashem. The Talmud tells us that the root of the day of Yom Kippur is the fact that we're close to Hashem. We're before Hashem. Uh, Talmud even goes as far as to say that the various 
factors that usually inhibit man's closeness to God, namely the Satan or the Yetzirah, is temporarily removed for that day, and therefore it's an opportunity, almost as if the prison doors are uh, swung wide open for one day, it's an opportunity to try to maximize and accomplish as much as we possibly can on this reprieve of one day. Of course, after the day is over, whatever you got, you got, and you'll have to wait till next year. The chapter 17 talks about several laws, again, related to sacrifices. Uh, the bulk majority of sacrificial law has already been covered in Leviticus. We'll get to a little more of it. In verse 10, we're told again, we've seen this several times before, uh, not to consume blood of any sort. The Talmud does tell us the reason why the Torah uh, warns us so stringently and so frequently about not consuming blood is for our own benefit. Because most people don't like to taste the blood anyhow. Blood is not tasty. So it's not a, it's not a transgression that we want to do anyhow. So the Almighty piles on the prohibitions to give us the feeling, oh, well, by abstaining from consumption of blood, we can accomplish so many different mitzvahs. Now the Talmud concludes by saying, well, if the Almighty gives us so many, if the Almighty gives us so many mitzvahs to refrain from something we don't want to do, how much more powerful it is to refrain from something that we are tremendously desirous of and yet we withstand the temptations. And now there's another interesting bit mitzvah here in verse 13 that is when you slaughter an animal, specifically a bird or a a uh, non-domesticated animal, you, there's a mitzvah to cover the blood with dirt, cover the blood. Um, why? The verse tells us, because blood represents life. You're sort of burying the life, so to speak, of the animal. Now, it's interesting that this law does not apply to, let's say, cows, domesticated animals. It only applies to birds and to uh, beasts. Uh, the Talmud does give a fascinating backstory to the origin of this mitzvah. A very surprising episode that uh, that caused the animal to merit this burial. All the way back to Genesis. Cain and Abel. Fratricide. Terrible, right? We have uh, Cain murdering his brother. Well, what did he do with the body? He knew what to do with it. There was no... Uh, past uh, experience that he could draw upon. So Talmud tells that there were two birds that came to the spot. One bird killed the other bird and dug, burrowed a little hole, put the dead bird in it, and covered it. Cain saw this and he dug a hole and he buried his deceased, murdered brother. Says the Talmud, Thanks to this episode, birds will forever merit that they too are buried. Really interesting idea. Um, I think my grandfather used to always say is that the way you are, the way how do you achieve spiritual achievements? It's only by spiritual activities. So the mitzvah of have the birds blood being covered is only achieved because there was some spiritual activity that they that the birds as a species contributed and therefore it's directly commensurate to what they put in is what they take out of it. Very, very interesting idea. Now, uh, chapter 18 deals with the prohibitions of forbidden sexual relationships and it, de it details all of them that are prohibited. And it begins, so this is the prohibitions and actually in the second uh, parsha we're, we're going to learn about the punishments as well. So it breaks it down in chapter 18, it's the prohibitions, and chapter 20, I believe, is the uh, punishments that someone gets for all these forbidden sexual relationships. But it's important for us to read here the first several verses that introduce the topic. Hashem spoke to Moshe, to, to saying, to tell over the Jewish people, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, I am Hashem your God. Do not perform the practice of the land of Egypt in which you had dwell. Do not perform the practice of the land of Canaan to which I will bring you. Do not follow their traditions. Rashi tells us here that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan were both standouts in uh, illicit promiscuity. 
Jewish people were surrounded, both when they were in Egypt and when they finally arrived in Israel, then called Canaan, by people, neighbors, who had uh, immoral behavior and were being warned, don't behave as they behave. And it's interesting, like we have many prohibitions already given in the Torah, and we've never seen this introduction, don't behave in the way of your neighbors, or it, 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 it is surprising. And then, in verse 4 and 5, there's another exhortation to observe the, the laws and the edicts and uh, all the various different laws, and you shall live. So I want to break this down. Rashi does a very good job, as he always does, in breaking down the subtleties of these verses. We're told, speak to the people, I am Hashem. Well, what's the meaning of telling us, I am Hashem? What Sarashi tells us is that perhaps someone may argue that these forbidden relationships, well, no, no one's harmed. There's no victim. And many mitzvahs in the Torah, like the chukim, the edicts, we are sometimes have a hard time understanding. Well, why does God say this? And why does he say that? And we're told at the beginning, no, I'm Hashem. I'm the, I'm the boss. You're the follower. I'm the master. You're the servant. You follow instructions whether you understand them or not. Very important idea that the Torah is trying to impress upon us. And then it tells us that don't do the, like, like the land, like the behavior of the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan. Rashi tells us very surprisingly that the two most immoral nations of the time were both the Egyptians and the Canaanites. And to me, I think the question that, that, uh, intrigues me, is why specifically the neighbors of the Jews are always the most corrupt? Uh, why is it that there has to be this clash? The Jewish people are always surrounded by neighbors that are, you know, bad influences upon them. Maybe there always is going to be a balance. So if someone is, a, uh, is an outsider and he sees the nation on one hand that is at the peak of spiritual greatness, well, that has to be balanced out by the nation or by their neighbors that are in the peak of spiritual degradation. Now, there's another fascinating Rashi here. It says at the end of the verse, it says, don't perform like the, like the uh, activities of the land of Egypt or like the land of Canaan. Do not follow their traditions. That's the end of the verse. Says Rashi from the Talmud, is that we have to be distinct and even in ways that are ambiguous. They're not necessarily evil acts of the Egyptians or the Canaanites, but they're just Canaanite behaviors. We have to try to be standouts. We have to be different and distinct as a nation. We cannot behave in the same way, even in ways, of course, we have to avoid the sinful ways of the Egyptians and the Canaanites, but we also not have to not, not follow their tradition. Talmud goes as far as saying that in certain um, times in history, Jewish people had different kinds of shoelaces than their neighbors. Jews would wear different shoelaces. Of course, shoelaces are not sinful. But if the, if the Egyptians or their neighbors will wear red shoelaces, they wear black ones. If they were black ones, they would wear green ones. They, they, they would try to be different. They try to say we're different than our neighbors in fulfillment of this mitzvah. And I think today I would argue, or I would say probably since the Enlightenment, about 200 years or so of Jewish history, the trend has been in the opposite direction. Let's try to become as similar as we can. Let's try to acculturate and assimilate. And that's uh, worked out with uh, mixed results, if, shall we say. I look at verse 4 and 5. Carry out my laws, perform the laws, safeguard my decrees, my edicts to go in their ways. I am the Lord Hashem, and you shall guard the edicts and the laws that through a person's performance of those laws, they shall live. I am Hashem. What does it mean they shall live, says Rashi? It's not referring to life in this world because everyone eventually in this world dies. You can't say, the Torah cannot say, you will live if you will eventually ultimately die. Obviously, says Rashi, this is referring to eternal life. And here is a pledge for eternal life. The, the, the Torah is telling us, do the mitzvahs. Kind of simple, not so complicated, and you'll have eternal life. Very powerful idea here. 
and then it launches into a um, rapid fire of forbidden sexual relationships, uh, parents, step parents, siblings, children, married women, um, half sisters, uh, mothers, um, aunts, daughters in law. It really goes through them all. And of course, the lightning rod of controversy. Uh, in verse 22 is homosexuality and 23 not quite as controversial is bestiality now clearly in modern society this has become widely accepted uh, but i think we have to agree on the facts and the facts are that the torah says it's prohibited uh, even if society says that it's not a lot of people are very disturbed by that and they try to use uh, textual chicanery to try to change what the Torah does, to make it conform to what they and their society believes. Of course, we don't do that. We're willing to accept the fact that we don't necessarily understand things. In fact, this whole section was predicated by a statement that we have to accept that God's edicts, which is mitzvahs that we can't understand. Maybe indeed this too is a mitzvah that, that does not sit well uh, to modern society or to certain segments of my society and that's okay we're willing to accept that but regardless we have to have fidelity to the text the text is clear it's it is prohibited by torah law uh, homosexuality is what we do with that how we grapple with that that is a discussion for another time the section concludes very interesting section here in verse 24 uh, through the end of the parsha. And it does link this behavior back to the Canaanites. Do not become contaminated through any of these behaviors because the Canaanites, the land of Israel, became contaminated because of their behavior and the land disgorged, it expelled, it vomited it out its inhabitants. What it's telling, what, what Moshe is instructing to tell the Jewish people here is that this behavior was prevalent in Canaan. And the reason why you're about to displace the indigenous people of Canaan is because, not because of your greatness per se, but because of the fact that the land itself has a spiritual sensitivity and it does, it is not compatible with such behavior. And they had this behavior and therefore they were expelled. And by the way, if you have this same behavior, you too will be expelled because the land itself has certain sensitivities and it will not allow continued residents of a nation that contaminates it and thus concludes Achare, and we begin kedoshim again if you just read it continuously you wouldn't know that there's because it starts off with a verse speak to the entire assembly of israel and tell them be holy for i am holy and this is a very famous idea here the ramban tells us uh, first of all, Rashi does link it to the previous section. Uh, says Rashi, wherever, quotes from the Talmud, wherever there is modesty, there is holiness. Well, what's the definition of holiness? Modesty, according to uh, this juxtaposition of the laws of forbidden sexual relationships with the declaration of be holy. The Ramban, very famous Ramban here in this, in the beginning of this parsha, uh, he explains what the idea of holiness is. And he says, you know, we had in previous parashas all the forbidden foods that we're not allowed to eat. I had to have kosher food. And now this past parasha, we have all the forbidden sexual relationships. And it tells us, well, what's kosher in the culinary department? What's a kosher in the department of uh, intimacy? So we know what's allowed and what's not allowed. But, you know, what's the objective of the Jew? Is the objective of the Jew to be a heathen with a stamp of kosher from the Torah? Says the Ram, it's possible for someone to say, hey, listen, you know, I am married to this woman. Or in uh, under, strict, under strict biblical laws, I'm married to these multiple women. But they're all my wives and they're all, it's all kosher. 
And this is, uh, the meat's a thousand percent kosher, but all I do all day is guzzle and gluttony and consuming wine and being hedonistic and all these different kinds of ways, but it's all kosher. Is that kosher? That's a concern, says the Ramban. And therefore, specifically after we're told what is strictly forbidden, we're told also there's an objective of holiness. That doesn't mean that everything that's permitted is something that you have to do uh, all the time. And therefore, uh, says the Ramban, we have an objective, a bigger goal, and the goal is spiritual. And too much immersion in Permitted, for sure, but permitted physical indulgences is going to contradict uh, a life of spiritual pursuits. And that's why we're told, after the things that are strictly prohibited, we're told, still there's an overall objective of becoming holy, like God, very spiritual. And to do that, we have to redirect our energy and our focus to spiritual pursuits as well. We, again, are told to honor and fear our parents, observe the Shabbos. There's, uh, the mitzvah that's warned more than any other is the mitzvah of Shabbos. Again, we're warned to not go and do idolatry of any sorts. And this, this parsha is fascinating if you just read it. It's one after another, mitzvah after mitzvah. Very powerful, just, just a, an easy reading, not hard reading. Uh, so, for example, here, we have in verse 9, there's three mitzvahs given uh, when someone is a landowner. Someone's a farmer. What are the mitzvah? What charity does it give? So, we don't know, of course, it's a mitzvah of charity to help those that are less fortunate. But specifically, when we have harvest, there is a mitzvah to not... Uh, to not harvest the corner of the field. It's called a peya. Also, if someone's gathering all their crops and a little bit drops off, they're not allowed to pick it up. They have to leave it for the poor person. And lastly, the underdeveloped vines we have to leave for the per- poor person. Again, there's a, a a certain sensitivity that the Torah is trying to place upon us. We're trying to become holy, trying to become spiritual people. And we do that in a multitude of ways. Of course, it is disavowal of idolatry and all the prohibited behaviors. And of course, it's also embracing our fellow human. We're told here not to steal, not to lie, not to deny falsely, not to swear falsely, not to cheat. Uh, When you have a laborer, mitzvah in the Torah, you have a laborer, you have to pay him that day. You're not allowed to, not allowed to have your worker go and leave the work site without being paid what he deserves. Uh, we're told not to curse the deaf, not to take advantage of those that are defenseless. Do not place a stumbling block before the blind. Now, this could be either a literal stumbling block or a, a proverbial stumbling block. And when someone, let's say, is coming to you for advice, uh, you are, according to this Mitzvah, you are not allowed to mislead them. An- a- another powerful idea, when you're a, when you're a judge, so you have to be a righteous judge. So the verse tells us, don't commit a perversion of justice. Don't favor the poor. You may think, well, I'm a judge. I'm going to legislate from the bench. I'm going to be the one who says, well, this person is poor, and this person, the, the, the other litigant, they're so rich. I'm going to favor the poor. That's righteous. No, that's not your job. Don't try to – don't argue that God is not being fair. I'm going to I'm gonna straighten out God's uh, misdeed, so to speak. I'm going to make this person, even though it's not according to the, my responsibility with the, to uphold justice, is not to favor the poor. Very powerful idea, which is counter, counterintuitive. Uh, but just a very powerful verse, just verse 15 of what we think about jurisprudence. Don't commit a perversion of justice. Don't favor the poor. Don't honor the powerful. With righteousness shall you judge your fellow. Don't be a gossip monger. Again, each one of these mitzvahs, we could have an entire class. In fact, I think we did have an entire class on the laws of Lashon Hora and the meaning behind it and all that. Here's the verse. Uh, Do not be a gossip monger among your people. By the way, this is one of the verses. There's a total of 31 all told. Do not stand aside while your fellow's blood is shed. So there's a mitzvah. If you see someone is suffering, you cannot remain, remain idle. 
Don't hate your brother in your heart. If you hate someone, you actually have to tell them that you hate them, which might be a little awkward. You cannot say, you cannot harbor hate in your heart. You Ideally, you shouldn't ha- hate anyone. But if you do hate someone, don't uh, let it uh, percolate in your heart. You have to tell them, by the way, um, I hate you. That's better. <laughs> that's, be honest about it. that's better than hating them in the heart. Because you know why? If you do that, hopefully you can achieve reconciliation. Say, whoa, 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 why do you hate me? A lot of times people, they hate someone and the other person's not even aware of it. Because they, well, they thought of something, there's miscommunication and, and there's hate needlessly. You tell someone I hate you and you can iron out your differences, hopefully, and s- love and harmony shall resume. Another mitzvah, again, I, I, we're going through this quickly because the parsha is, we're, we're time constricted here. Ideally, we should really stop and talk about this uh, with more detail. Uh, you shall reprove your fellow. There's a mitzvah in the Torah to not stand idly when someone else is making a mistake. You have to give them what's called tochacha. You have to castigation. You have to correct them. If you say you're making a mistake, and of course, Talmud says, just like there's a mitzvah to uh, give reproach when it will be listened to, when it will be heeded, there is the same mitzvah to not give the reproach when it will not be heeded. So that does not. So that means don't just go around telling people you're making mistakes because it's very likely that it will not be heated in that in that in that setting or in that process. Make sure you wait for the appropriate conditions to uh, to reproach them, and that way it will be it will be accepted. By the way, the verse ends: "Do not bear a sin because of him." The reason why it says that is because all Jews are connected. Therefore, someone else's sin, well, we can't say that's his sin, his problem. It's actually his sin, my problem, because we're all connected and his sin affects the totality. And that ideal is actually present in verse 18, which is the most famous verse in all of Torah, in all, in all likelihood. You shall not take revenge. You should not bear a grudge against the members of your people. You should love your fellow as yourself. I am, I am Hashem. This, of course, was plagiarized by other religions. But here's where it shows up the first time in the Torah, love your fellow as yourself. Briefly, we know that this mitzvah is, according to the Talmud, according to Hillel, all of Torah on one leg is this mitzvah. Rabbi Akiva and the Yerushalmi tells us that uh, this is a major principle of all of Torah. And we have to understand this. Remember, the Torah is not giving us hyperbole. There's no hyperbole in the Torah. When it says... You shall love your fellow as yourself. That, what does that mean? It means you shall love your fellow as yourself. Well, that's not what that means, but that's what it means. It starts off by saying, don't take revenge and don't bear a grudge. And then it pivots, don't love you love your fellow as yourself. Of course, to love your fellow as yourself, regardless of who the fellow is, as yourself is a high bar. We have to understand how could you possibly uh, give over that same love to other people. It seems very difficult. Perhaps we could argue that this is not a mitzvah of love. It's a mitzvah of behavior. Behave as if you love them, which is again, it's uh, even even that would be difficult. But that I, that seems to be a deviation from what the verse says. It doesn't say you shall behave with love. It says you shall love. It's an it's a mitzvah to have an emotion. I want to share a brief idea here. Talmud tells us uh, in the first part of the mitzvah, don't take revenge. Says the Talmud, what's it like? You have someone. Who is cutting meat, a butcher is cutting meat with a really sharp meat cleaver. And he's a little reckless, and unfortunately, he cuts his hand. It's not clear from the Talmud if he cuts it off, or he makes a huge gash. But regardless, his hand is now bleeding. And of course, the left hand is very disappointed because now it's bleeding. So what does it do? It picks up the meat cleaver and exacts retribution and revenge and cuts the right hand off. Of course, that's senseless. Says the Talmud, that's revenge. There are many sources to this. I don't want to give you body down with the details, but the sources are clear that at the level of the soul, we're all united. Certainly all Jews are united at the soul level. We're placed in a body, body's division. We're separate from other people. At the soul level, Two Jews are like two hands, right hand and left hand, a part of the same broader entity. Therefore, if someone is bad to you, yes, they did evil to you, but it's illogical and preposterous to cut off your right hand because, you know, despite your, despite it, it doesn't make any sense. In reality, in the soul's reality, it's illogical. That's how the verse starts. 
And the verse concludes, you shall love your fellow as yourself, the commentators say. Some of the commentators say, notably the Tomer Devorah in chapter 1. As yourself means literally, because they literally are yourself. You're On the soul level, you're actually two aspects of the same entity. And therefore, what this verse in totality is encouraging us is become more soul-like. Divest yourself as much as you can of your body's identity and embrace your soul's identity. By dint of that, revenge will be illogical and you will naturally love yourself as yourself because you love your right hand as you love your left hand. And thus, when Rabbi Kiva and Hillel were telling us all of Torah is condensed into this verse, what it actually means is that all of Torah is that it had to become a soul and it had to disavow your body. And had changed your identity. And had to embrace the spiritual aspects of your life. Again, no hyperbole. Very powerful ideas. And we said it kind of quickly. Okay, so very quickly here, we're told, verse 19, not to mix. We don't mix uh, different animals with each other. We don't mix different parts of um, agriculture with each other. We don't mix garment. We not let them shotness, laws of shotness, not to wear garment, which is a combination of wool and linen. There are other laws here, very different, one after another. Um, uh, laws of Shiv Harufa, the laws of uh, Arla, which means the first three years of a fruit tree, it's off limits. Uh, the fourth year, it's kind of in the in between stage. Fifth year, you can consume it, no problem. Do not eat over the blood of verse 26. is a fascinating verse. I encourage everyone to find the Talmud. It's an entry on page 63a, which does deduce many, many different laws. Don't engage in sorcery of any sort. Don't have tattoos. Don't cut your skin uh, over the dead person. People used to have a tradition when they, they were racked with mourning. They just ripped themselves to pieces, prohibited by Torah law. The mitzvah of peyos, not to cut the edge of your scalp. That's why people have peyos today, which they go the opposite direction. Uh, they have the uh, side locks. Don't encourage your daughter to become a harlot. Self-understood. Uh, <laughs> Do not engage in various forms of necromancy. Uh, called Ove and Yedoni. The Talmud describes what people used to do. Again, these are all practices that were prevalent in, Can- in Canaan. The Jews are about to enter Canaan and they are being warned uh, to not engage in such behavior. Uh, verse 32, in the presence of an old man you sh- shall you rise. Again, another powerful law of how to become a great person, how to become holy. Honor the presence of a sage. Revere your God. You have to love the the ger. This is one of the several times in the Torah where we're told that the convert, there's a special mitzvah to love the convert. This is someone who is feels out of place, someone who feels uh, that uh, they, they are on the margins of society. You have to go out of your way to love them as well. Do not do any trickery in business, which means if you have a, a fruit store and you're selling people a pound of apples, make sure it's a pound, not a, not an ounce less. And, of course, Hashem knows exactly the measurements and any of your shtick Hashem is aware of. Chapter 20 tells us the uh, the punishments for all these sins. Some of them are uh, very, very severe that would render a person to be excommunicated and disassociated and disenfranchised and cut off from the Jewish people. Uh, others will have the punishment of death. Uh, and it goes through all the forbidden sexual relationships of Chapter 18 and chapter 20, we're told the punishments. And again, at the end of chapter 20, we're told, uh, you shall observe my decrees and my ordinances, the edicts, perform them. And then when you get to the land of Israel, it will not expel you. Do not follow the traditions of the nation that it's, that I expel from before you. For they did all of those, these and I was disgusted with them. But you shall inherit the land, and I'll give it to you. The reason why we got the land is not because of our own greatness, but because of the sins of the inhabitants and the pledges given to Abraham. And we, too, have to recognize that the same standard of behavior that's in the land of Israel that applied to the Canaanites and resulted in their expulsion will apply to us. Again, we are uh, encouraged to eat only kosher food. Separate between the clean animal, the unclean animal. Do not make our souls abominable with not kosher foods. And finally, you shall be holy. 
for I, Hashem, Hashem ha- am holy and don't do any of these horrific sins. I've separated you from the people to be mine. We are God's people, and therefore we're encouraged to become more God-like, more similar to God in our behavior, and that is just like God is holy, we too have to become holy. Holy, again, is a euphemism for more spiritual in pursuit and interest and agenda and ideally in identity. The more spiritual we are, of course, the more we're going to love our fellow as ourselves because the more soul-like we are, the more we are identifying with our half that uh, is indistinguishable from uh, other people. All souls are united and thus uh, this pursuit makes us more like God. It is the approach to become uh, to strengthen the relationship that man has with his creator, man, of course, is mankind, and it simultaneously achieves uh, love and harmony and peace between uh, man and his fellow. Again, the idea of holiness covers all the relationships that we encounter in life between us and our creator and us and our fellow man.